Uh, sorry, yeah, Prime Minister, whenever you're ready. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's working. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to begin my speech in three, two, one. Three things in this speech. One, a simple model about the kinds of things that we're going to do to the local sector and the local uh, region. Secondly, I'm going to be explaining the context of the COVID-19 crisis and why the local economy is revised, uh, is devastated through these services and through international trade. Lastly, I'm going to be talking about the counterfactual, why the sector is improved significantly throughout the investment in the local sector and why that is particularly necessary in the current scenario. First, a simple model, right? I think the kinds of things that we're going to be doing on our side of the house is that we're going to be providing subsidies, for example, to the local sector. That is to produce, make it so that the farmers are able to like give the funding to the far local farmers who are then able to decrease the cost of production, or for example, to give consumers uh, certain vouchers for the local products so they're able to buy them cheaper which supports the local companies at the end. There are so many ways upon which we're able to do this, but I think that's the first start, the kind of things that we're probably going to be implementing. Moving right along to the substantive, right? Why is the local economy devastated and why is it that international trade devastates these countries? Uh, I first want to point a, like a point of framing that I want to employ throughout this debate, which is that during the COVID-19 crisis, most corporations in these, in these countries either did one of two things. One is that they stopped production or that they significantly reduced their production uh, in the end, right? And we think that there was a significant vacuum of the kind of contracts that these corporations had, right? That is that there's a severe vacuum in that all of them stopped production, which meant that powerful countries like uh, those in the like like those of China, were able to then aggressively buy these shares in the global trade, so that at uh, global trade, so that they're able to dominate the market there through the usage of what is now a vacuum in that area, to the detriment of the local population, and that is the kind of thing that we're trying to prevent on our side of the house. Why is it the fact that these why why is it the case? that these post COVID-19 like economically weaker countries are going to lose the international trade. There are five reasons for this. The first is because loaning money is incredibly low. And this is for a variety of reasons. One is because they offer, because the offering of collateral is much more lower than those of huge states, but also because the credit rating in these countries of corporations in these countries is far lower than that of, for example, China or the developed countries, right? So the amount of money that you're able to gain in the first place to like make your corporation or to invest in your corporation is significantly lower at the extent to which the loan that you have is also incredibly low. Secondly, is because it is in, because the these countries have incredibly smaller economies of, economies of scale, right? And we think that this is also in the, done in the context of international trade. If you have countries like the countries that belong in the BRICS, or if you have talking about like China, for instance, right? Those countries have lots of finance, lots of people. They're able to outcompete you in so many different ways because of just different economies of scale, right? And there's a history of this happening. But thirdly, is because of the fact that their history of reliance on domestic uh, or on, on direct foreign investments uh, to those corporations for them to succeed. And we think that was because of the historic aspects upon which there are many, many corporations that tried to invest in these corporations on the local level, uh, local level, right? So they, they were relying on direct foreign investment prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we think that is incredibly harmful because other countries probably uh, who were investing before don't have the ability to invest in these corporations. Therefore, it's unlikely that they're able to do those uh, to make production in the domestic level, we think that export is far unlikely to be happening, right? Fourthly, it's because of predatory pricing. That is because of like, for example, the ability for countries like China or con like countries like China who have lots of financial capacity are able to suffer short-term losses through things, for example, like dumping or through, uh, you know, dunking prices to very low in the local economy. That is, um, that means that those countries are able to gain a significant advantage to the detriment of the local population who is not able to sustain through those ends, right? And we think that this is something that only very big countries with like large economies of scale are able to do, which comes at the detriment of the people on the ground in these uh, in these like economically worse off countries. Fifthly, is because of monocultural structures upon which uh, these economies operated beforehand. That is that because 
the, the, uh, I don't know, the economically weaker countries focused on things like, for example, tea or tobacco or like tourism that was like immediately cut off and deprioritized at the moment the COVID-19 pandemic happened. And because those economies were structured upon in those areas means all of these things mean that they're unable to gain a significant leverage in the international trade of, um, through all of these points of mechanism that I indicate here in my speech, right? What is the implication of this, right? And we want to point out that protectionism is something that is only possible on our side of the house. That is because insofar as you do international trade, countries try and have an incentive to try and make fair deals because it's a reciprocal agreement. It's always a problem about give and take, right? So the amount of goods that like China or other countries are going to give to a country mean that you have to do the same in return and tread lower tariffs or lower, you know, for example, the amount of uh, lower uh, like tariffs in general, right? Because you want those lower tariffs. All of these things indicate that because cheap products of China is going to over be flood flooding, over flooding into your country mean that you just kill the local economy uh, in, in the first place. And we think that the implication of this is grand because that means that because of these local corporations, local, uh, because of like these um, big exports that are going to be destroying your companies, it just devastates local farmers because the kinds of things that are going to be done uh, is going to be done on a grand scale uh, about the, particularly about like, for example, food uh, that is particularly harmful. But before we move on though, sure. If a country has had a had a booming service sector before COVID, why would why would they suddenly come under so much pressure from Chinese dumping and their economy wouldn't be able to survive? Well, obviously, I well that just responds to just a simple piece of mechanism, but I've indicated to you five layers of analysis of why they're all unlikely to win in international trade, particularly because of the COVID-19 pandemic, means that there's a distance, like at least a you know. It is far because countries have much more propensity to abuse the system insofar as there is an economic propensity and because most of the countries are quite desperate means that it comes at the detriment of the economically worse off countries who don't have the ability to be able to voice themselves out, right? Finally, about the counterfactual why local production is likely to work, right? We only want to point out that this is particularly because there's no outward competition that exists, right? They don't have to face off against the things that I described previously about you know, flooding or the other kinds of mechanisms about how they're likely to lose in that capacity, uh, in the competition. The countries that don't have as much capacity are able to, for the first time, uh, like go against those countries. There are two things in particular that benefits these local economies. First is because there are more jobs because more local corporations are likely to prosper at the moment in which you don't have to engage within that competition. That means that more people are able to have jobs. That means that more people are able to have be breadwinners and keep food on the table, which is critically important, especially in a context upon which there's severe lack of food or sh food shortages. But B, because it's easier to do this on a local companies. Prior to this, MNCs existed probably in these coal companies and they had lots of money, which means that they're able to like exert pressure upon the go local government to loosen environmental regulations, to loosen labor standards, which is an incredibly big problem in these areas, right? Whereas compared to that, if you have local companies, the government is much more easier to regulate this because they have leverage over that. That means that you're able to collect taxes that is then able to, you know, stipulate other plates of the government or other pro projects, which is incredibly beneficial and incredibly important in order to collectivize and try and try and help the local population. For all of those reasons, that's for a start why we propose. All right, great. Thank you very much for the Prime Minister for those remarks. To open opposition side of the House's case, Leader of Opposition, please. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Clear. Great. Uh, just give me 30 seconds. Mm I'll begin in three, two, one. Panel government bench has been incredibly weak in providing the type of economic analysis to justify sh a wholesale shift in countries' economic sector, especially at the point at which it is suffering economically after COVID. They needed to do a lot more. But first, let's be very clear on what we're debating here. Government burden in this debate is for is to defend defend economically weaker countries focusing heavily on manufacturing as many goods as possible 
for their local markets this means that even if they aren't even if they weren't manufacturing certain things before covid and even if they have no historical like manufacturing capability in those things they need to try to set up manufacturing facilities and they would need to try to decrease import of real sector goods as much as possible which means that they would also probably have to increase import tariffs to a large extent and they have never proven why that is a possible and b desirable to do so on our side however we will have no preference for the type of sector that the, that any economic that any economically weaker country operates in that is to say if a country was like india and they're really good at like it services and outsourcing we think we, we would we would want government the government of india to still focus on these on this sector and still try to uh, like promote this sector only uh, however if if we are talking about a country like bangladesh which is like extremely good at textile exports we would want that government to focus on textile imports essentially we would want countries to focus on what they're good at and like continue to rely on international trade to import uh, import goods and services that they aren't good at which means the metric for this debate is to see which on which side the country's economy which country the con economy of weaker countries are going to recover faster especially after covid notice that it is important to know important to like make sure that these economies re like uh, recover as fast as quickly as possible as well because in after covid especially a large number of people within these countries are unemployed government debt is growing and they have they need to spend a lot in terms of to in order to fund a stimulus package which means that inflation is also growing which means that like gov government can't win by proving that they have some possibility of like increasing their increasing their economy a lot in 10 years time this debate is about what government should do right now in order to save their economy from going into large scale recession I, I, most resp responses would be integrated the first thing we like to say here is that like shifting your uh, shifting your um uh, shifting your economy away from services into manufacturing if you have no prior experience in that is an extremely inefficient allocation of resources because notice that this motion is only the the uh, the th this debate happens only in countries which weren't prior, prior which weren't focusing heavily on manufacturing before right if they were doing so before they would continue to do so on our side as well but if they haven't done so before means that they simply do not have the means for setting up large scale factories and setting up large scale uh, large scale supply chains that are required for manufacturing furthermore they do furthermore they would they would also have to increase the protectionism of their country which means they would have to like give tax breaks etc which would also cost a lot of money to the taxpayer we think it's far better used to like uh, incentivize uh, sectors which are already growing but so secondly notice that you you are unlikely to get any international investment into these sectors right because these sectors are unproven and you have no and like international investors have no reason to believe that you will be good at these sort of things and because like there uh, the, the the amount of foreign direct investment is anyway reduced after covid we think it's unlikely that you will be able to get international investment which means that it is going to be a large inefficient waste of like scarce government funds but secondly we tell you that the goods that you are able to you might be able to produce are going to be a extremely expensive and b of inferior quality multiple reasons for this firstly notice that like this uh, if you are all as i already mentioned if you are focusing on real sector goods before covid you would already you would continue to do so on our side as well the difference is when a country is not a traditional manufacturer of some good but like the, but they have a high they have high local demand for that good government's burden was to try to prove to you why they should produce those goods too but notice that it is extremely difficult to set up manufacturing facilities overnight right? because there is less capital available within the country after covid it is extremely difficult to set up factories which require a large amount of fixed cost these countries would also not have like a significant manpower expertise in terms of manufacturing these things and furthermore they also wouldn't have the supply chains required for importing raw materials required to manufacture these sort of real sector goods but even beyond that notice that because of, because precisely economies of scale exist means that producing small quantities of goods are much more expensive than producing large quantities which means that the goods that you produce in your country are always going to be more expensive than the ones you had imported from china which means that the goods you produce on gov side are going to be of low quality and are going to be higher priced why this is why is this so important two reasons 
Number one, it means that the goods that are going to be used by your own citizens are going to become more expensive and inferior in quality. If a country used to manage, if, if a country used to import agriculture machinery and fertilizers before COVID, they're going to do it. They're going to try to produce them after COVID in government's world, which means that these things are always going to be more expensive than the Chinese produced fertilizers and agriculture machinery. Which means what you're essentially happening is that you're making poor farmers pay more for inferior goods because at a time when their incomes has already been reduced by COVID. Which means that they need to defend why they are they are going to subjugate their citizens to paying paying more for inferior quality goods. But secondly, this also means that you're never going to be competitive in the international market because you're not because your goods aren't of the same quality. You'll never be able to export these goods to and compete with a country like China and never be able to get valuable foreign exchange. On the comparative, if we focus on things we're actually good at, even if it is within the service sector, we would at least be able to provide some level of foreign exchange. Government says that China dumps a lot of material. That we think this also ensures that people within the country has access to high quality, cheap goods, and they need to prove why countries are able to replace these imports and maintain low prices at the same time. But finally, we tell you that like, focusing on the service sector is um, is much more uh, for a short short bet for several reasons. Firstly, notice that in order to in order for your real sector economy to go grow, you need demand on your own country to rebound, since you need your own citizens to consume goods. On the comparison, the service sector requires demand in rich foreign countries to grow, right? Because things like outsourcing and hospitality depends on like clients in in the USA wanting these services means that you're dependent on demand within foreign countries. We think that. This is much more likely to be stable and much more likely to be sustainable because the economy of countries in USA and Europe have, have already exited recession and are growing much faster as compared to poor countries like India and Bangladesh, which are literally losing 10% of their GDP every this year due to COVID. But, but even beyond that, notice that the transition in the economy post-COVID means that these service sectors are going to be inherently more attractive, right? A lot of companies are working towards things like work from home and cutting costs, which means that things like IT startups and call centers are going to be increasingly more in demand on our side. For all these reasons, we don't think that countries should over shift their economies overnight, proud to oppose. All right, thank you very much. Opposition side of the house uh, for the leader of opposition's remarks. Um, to continue the government side of the house's case, DPM, please, you're here. Hello, can I be heard? Yep, very clear. Sorry, I lost track of my thing. I'm going to do two things in this speech. The first is to debunk the premise of the opposition side of the house. In particular, I'm going to challenge the premise that comparative, that com comparative advantage exists to these countries, which makes them flourish in long term, according to their claim. I'm going to prove to you that that is false in very majority of instances and why this gives no economic benefit to the countries in question. Secondly, I'm going to make a lot of comparisons and show you why in terms of immediacy of recovery, which I think was the main claim of LO, uh, we still get that better. And also why in terms of certainty, certainty of recovery, which I think is presumably very important for these countries, we still win that debate. First, responding to their case. The first claim that they had is comparative advantage exists because Bangladesh. 
The first thing I have to ask is, does it exist really? Because they just assert that Bangladesh had comparative advantage. Just giving one example, without really, without really thinking of structural reasons as to why that is likely for countries in Asia with lower economic capacity than other countries. We would posit that empirically this is false, for the reason that if you look at countries like Laos or Mongolia, for example, these are relatively weaker countries within Asia who have no comparative advantage. And the reason for this is many countries in Asia share comparative advantages. For example, well, obviously Bangladesh has a lot of manpower, but so does many of the countries in Southeast Asia. But the only, there's only one winner in the race for creating cheaper textile, for example, cheaper clothing. Therefore, to the extent Bangladesh was able to take a head start, for example, by attracting foreign investment, all of the other countries weren't able to take that advantage and therefore lost out on that competition. I think it is more likely that all the other countries, are like, are apart from Bangladesh, for example, is unlikely to have comparative advantage in this particular world. But the second reason, and this is more structural, why this isn't true, uh, even if Bangladesh was the context is because they died in this pandemic, right? I think many of these countries are reliant on foreign direct investment to set up things like factories, to set up things like, uh, you know, infrastructure in order to be able, in order for workers in your country to be able to work and to be able to gain income. To the extent that the, all of these countries were harmed and damaged through this pandemic, and there was a, there was a dip, uh, dip in demand, which meant that co corporations had to pull out, you know, pull out international and foreign direct investment from uh, countries abroad, it is likely that these factories have gone like have, haven't been operating for ages it's likely that all of the employees within these contexts have been cut due to cost reasons therefore it's unlikely that these countries will still continue to have that competitive advantage other their side of house but the final response is i think countries started producing a lot more than they used to pre-pandemic and this applies to many of the stronger countries in the world i think china thought the vacuum of uh, the, va the vacancy of the, the exporters in the world, for example, because you know Bangladesh couldn't really find the, the demand for their clothing anymore, uh, at least as much as it did in a pre-pandemic situation. We think China had an incentive to massively invest in these fields in order to regain the amount of, uh, regain the global influence, regain the market around the world. We think to the extent that China, for example, or many other countries as well, enter the market in which you, in which you prior to the pre-pandemic had advantage, means you, you're more likely to lose that comparative advantage because China, or for example, has more investment capacity in order to create things that are more efficient, in order to create things that are more in, like better in quality. I think this logic that doesn't say, make sense in the first instance, even if it did, it doesn't apply to this particular debate. Their claim next was lower quality and higher price. I have two reasons as to why this is not true. The first is I think these things that we're protecting on the other side of the house, local industries, these are things that already exist in the status quo. Things like agriculture, things like manufacturing of clothes, for example. These are oftentimes necessity. People want and need these things in order to survive their lives, even in the status quo. They are likely to exist on the other paradigm, have existed prior to the pandemic on the other side of the house as well. But the question that we're posing here is that we can make this more efficient. We can make these products cheaper compared to other foreign goods in order to accelerate the sales of these, pro these products on the other side of the house. I just, I just don't think it was that difficult to, like, like that difficult of a step in order to uh, increase local uh, production on the other side of the house. But the second thing is, even if this is not true, I think things like basic manufacturing or basic farming are not skills that are very, very difficult to acquire, right? I think it just takes a month or a week in order to acquire what you need to do within a clothing factory. I don't think it costs that much about like crazy amount of money. But I don't think they were able to impact why this lower quality meant anything to the people on the ground. I still think the impact that we put forward to you at your scale, the claim of unemployment, for example, is far more important than their claim. Um, yeah, then I'm going to move on to the comparison between the two paradigms. The first thing I'm going to focus on is immediacy of recovery, right? I think if you look at the motion, things like services, for example, is, uh, is extremely unlikely to be effective in short term. That is for the reason that many people choose not to travel abroad for the reason of COVID-19. That's because the, the services are inherently luxurious to people, as opposed to basic necessities that you're able to produce on the other side of the house. That's why their implication is only manifest in long term. But let's look at the international trade as well. I think this is also unlikely to be to have immediate impact for the reason that corporate contracts don't like don't like uh, come into effect like all of a sudden, right? 
you need to actually negotiate with other corporations. Uh, you, you need to negotiate with other partners, foreign foreign partners, for example. You need to be able to persuade that your quality is better than other corporations. You need to be able to persuade that the pricing that you have is lower and more competitive than other corporations. Corporations take a lot of time in order to make decisions. It is unlikely that they'll just make contracts all of a sudden. But the second thing is, it depends on the revival of foreign countries and its demands, right? I think it's more likely that these countries produce preliminary products as opposed to final products. It is, uh, therefore, your success is dependent on corporations it's a broad recovering, which I think is extremely unlikely or extreme, at, at the very least, it is very slow because the process of regaining employees, for example, and retraining them takes a lot of time if you're creating a final product in, for, like, in countries like you know Japan, for example, if you're producing, producing car. The second thing is certainty of recovery. A, we've told you that competition means you're unlikely to succeed. That reduces certainty. But secondly, just generally, I think economy, the economy is influenced by countless, countless factors, particularly those that are international. Things like economic cycle, like the fact that you have possibility of vaccination, for example, increase stock prices. The fact that it was an effect shown to be, shown not to be effective, reduce it, right? I think this means that the demand that they their case is premised upon is so fluctu fluctuate so often that you can't rely really rely on this thing because to the extent you there's a dip in demand you have a huge hit you have to decrease your employees and that means people suffering on the ground the final thing i want to note is that i think this is a plan this means you cannot imagine a perfect world of covid 19 situation as a country of this the, of the developing world that we're talking about right I think, for example, USA probably needs steel, but Japan needs something different from this particular country. In the present, it looks like USA will be will recover due to vaccination, and Japan maybe not. But uh, but you know, one month later, things may change, and the uh, and Japan might have a huge uh, bigger chance at recovering. This is super bad because investment is a longer term decision. This means you have to assume right, you're going to assume right now that US would recover and you know uh, invest accordingly in order to match the demand of US. But the next month you might think that this was a wrong decision. It might have been a more strategic to invest for Chinese demand. That means uh, this all of the fluctuation of the, and the changes in the situation that is quite likely in this pandemic situation is going to hurt the economy, the entire economy on the their side of the house, to the extent that there's a huge degree of uncertainty, there's a huge chance that your investment would go into vain. We think it's more certain on the other side of the house. And that's why we propose. All right, thank you very much, DPM, for those remarks. To continue opposition side of the house's case, uh, DLO, please, hear, here. Hi, am I audible? Very clear. Perfect. Just give me a few seconds, please. Um, sure. Starting my speech in three, sorry, sorry, I got my timer. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Two major problems in government's case. One, while they accuse us of saying that the international demand will be uncertain, they never prove to you why will the local demand be so definitive in nature or why does it even exist in the first place, given the context that itself says this is a struggling Asian economy. But second, they give you all these analysis about how they'll attract and incentivize domestic industries by giving them tax cuts, etc. but never engage with the structural reasons why capital does not exist either domestically or internationally, which means they need to prove to us how is it that they get the capital to be able to invest these local industries and create so much of, of, of like output simply because manufacturing and real estate sectors require large amounts of investment. If I can prove to you two things in my speech, I think we win this debate. One, that the service sector demand is much more definitive. And two, that a comparative advantage does exist in these economies. On the first, what comparative advantage? They say, ah, oh, there's no comparative advantage. 
One comparative advantage in places like Bangladesh is not just cheap labor, but also the availability of better climate to be able to go and build, uh, go and like manufacture cloths, right? You have a humid climate in Bangladesh, which is very, very suitable for that. Second, in places like India, etc., you have large amounts of natural resources. You have an English speaking population, which can contribute to the speaking, to the service sector economy by working in call centers and the IT sector. Third, even if I buy them at their best case, that literally all Asian countries are the same and they have no comparative advantage. Notice this, in a post COVID world, most countries want to dis distribute the supply chains to multiple countries, i.e. after knowing that China did what they did, they don't want to hedge all their bets in one particular country and only have a factory there. This is exactly what you see with the manufacture of iPhones, where I Apple's building factories in India, Taiwan, and Vietnam, because they don't want to go and hedge all their bets in one basket. This is very, very similar to the behavior of most multinational corporations who don't want to go and centralize all their investments, which means even if there's no comparative advantage, we think multiple Asian countries can benefit from the same company itself. So so I'm really not sure what the problem is in, in status quo. Then they say, ah, China floods the market. And also they say, you have to have a give and take relationship, which means you have to reduce import tariffs. One, even if China floods the market in the best case, it means access of cheap goods to individuals on the ground. Notice in a struggling economy where people don't have jobs and unemployment is at an all time high, I'm really not sure where do individuals get the capital to be able to buy local goods, which are going to be markedly more expensive and lesser quality than China, simply because they don't have the money to do so. They never give you any analysis as to how is it they will be able to replace all these finished goods which come from China on their side of the house. But two, at the point at which they concede in PM that this will be a give and take relationship, it also means that you can capitalize on your strengths in these economies, which means even if India imports palm oil from Malaysia, they can still go and export healthcare services and IT services to Malaysia because it's a give and take relationship. So I'm not sure why this comparative advantage and flooding ever happens. But third, even if China is a terrible actor and floods local industries, notice this. On their, side, on their side of the house, the real estate sectors have always relied on China for cheap access to things like fertilizers. The agricultural industries in most Asian countries want cheap fertilizers from China. So manufacturing industries want cheap raw material from China and from other nations, which means you're still reliant on other countries for the import of the raw materials and basics, like things like vaccines, etc. right? So I'm really not sure how is it they're able to transition completely from raw materials to to pre-manufactured goods, to finished goods, to demand in a one particular economy, which guess what, is struggling. So I have no analysis for that. I don't think they can win this clash either. Then they make this most slimy argument ever. These industries already exist and you can just learn how to build a cloth factory in one month. One, on the other hand, they say, ah, companies take a long time to sign contracts, but they can magically build factories in a month. I'm not sure how this is ever comparative. But two, factories literally require large amounts of investment for a long period of time. You need to buy land, you need to hire labor, get electricity permits, etc. You need infrastructure other than things beyond your control, which means things like roads, supply chains, etc., which are not in your control, but the government needs to go and build them. So I'm really not sure how you can magically build factories overnight. But second, notice this, right? Things like these, things like investment in the real estate sector have to be long-term, right? Which means if tomorrow the government thinks that, oh, look, a service sector is booming and the demand for this industry is booming, we can move our funds around there. They don't have that option because factories, etc., are static investments which they have to make for the long-term. In a post-COVID world, which is largely uncertain as per their own characterization, I am not sure why then they want the governments to hedge their bets on a static investment which can't be moved around. The last clash, and if I think I can prove this debate, I think we win this debate. Why the service sector is booming and not as per their characterization is failing. One is a fatigue in people, right? Individuals are fed up of sitting at home for one full year. You already have places around the world opening up for vacations. Hospitality industries are coming back to the peak normal, etc. right? People want to go and spend money because they've been saving up for a year. They're all frustrated, right? Which means, especially in developing, developed economies like places like Europe and US, where the vaccines have already started coming in, people are much more better equipped to be able to go to Asian countries and spend their money, right? They're able to go and have tourism, etc. Second, notice this, right? The service sector on our hand, especially when we have international trade, is not reliant on demand from the domestic economy alone. We rely on the economies of US and Europe, which are much better situated to be able to have imports from our country, which means if we're able to have a competitive advantage in certain things, and we prove to you why we do have those things, that means we're able to export to better economies who will have a sustained demand and are not as fragile as the local demand in our particular country. But thirdly, notice this, 
most economy most most sectors on their side like agriculture and manufacturing are extremely flimsy and reliant on multiple externalities most asian countries don't have the irrigation facilities to not rely on rainfall right which means places like india pakistan etc continues to rely on rainfall to the, for the agricultural produce to succeed which means even manufacturing on the other hand relies on things like cheap oil which is beyond your control so all these externalities which they talk about of the asian of the economic fluctuations are much worse on their side of the house because you literally have no control over things like rainfall or oil prices which is the premise of this real estate real sector economies but lastly most economies especially in the developed world are now transitioning to hybrid models of remote working this is not possible in developing countries which will obviously receive the vaccines much much later simply because of larger populations and second lack of supply chains and things like cold storages means that you will likely not be able to go and implement manufacturing sector immediately to a full fledged extent you have to go and implement some sort of a hybrid model on their side of the house which means on our side when you have a service sector it is much better equipped to work from home to go and transition into a hybrid model of a post covid economy something they can never do because they need people on ground and factories working their asses off day in and day out which means in the short term at least we're able to prove to you there's a demand does exist in europe us etc even if it's not existing in a domestic market to to have a competitive advantage which you cannot conceal in status quo by investing in things which require large capital funds they never tell you why do they have the money domestically or internationally and two why is it that you want to make a static investment when the uncertainty on the market is so much as per their own characterization for all these reasons i think it's very clear they need to mechanize to you where this money comes from where does the local demand come from or even if this to exist how is it that they are able to make up for all the cheap goods and cheap facilities international trade gives you no mechanization we win this debate thank you very much dlo for those remarks and as a final substantive from the government side of the house govwit please here here Am I audible? Yeah, clear. Thank you. Two things in this speech. Firstly, why do countries not have a comparative advantage? Why would they're likely to be screwed over in international trade? But secondly, even conceding that they had some sort of comparative advantage, why still they're likely to be fucked over in the long term, right? So, firstly, I like to point out two things, right? Two, uh, there are two reasons why opposition loses this debate. Firstly, I think that at best, all the benefits that they provide are speculative compared to ours, right? As in, yes, the U.S. may recover. Yes, the country might have comparative advantage. We don't know for certain. right whereas in our side of the house we are certain for example that there is domestic demand for things like low basic necessities things like food things like clothes in our side of the house so simply on the basis of the simply considering how uncertain things are in the future we don't know what's going to happen 4 or 5 years with the covid-19 crisis i think it's important to err on the side of caution considering that lives are on stake and therefore we think that we're beating them in terms of certainty right but secondly more we just notice that they never really gave you a mechanism as to why they actually can win in international trade or in the market in the first place the only thing they said that was, was india and bangladesh india is fucking rich they have 7% gdp growth per year they are not a weak Weaker, economically weaker Asian country. Moreover, Bangladesh is not either. Like we're obviously talking about countries like Cambodia, Laos, who do not have that level of economic strength. But before I go into my class, it's just two pieces of extraneous rebuttal, right? Firstly, I don't think that they can claim that the only relevant countries to this motion are ones that aren't good at things like manufacturing or. haven't done that before right that is obviously not true what 
What happens in our paradigm is that we focus on local and real goods. What happens in their paradigm is that they do not focus on those things. They cannot pick and choose which countries apply to this motion and do not. That is a bullet that they have to bite, right? But secondly, they had this point about taxpayer money and investment and how we're not going to be able to, be able to get it, right? Firstly, considering how weak the economy is due to things like the COVID-19 recession, I think in both paradigms, there's unlikely to be any sort of investment anyway, because especially considering that particularly these Asian countries are weak and are unlikely to get investment in either side of the house. But secondly, regarding their point on taxpayer money, I think that this is symmetrical. We invest in local economies. They still use that same taxpayer money to invest in strategic, internationally strategic fields. So I think that that is at best and symmetrical claim. Moreover, we told you that local corporations are easier to tax. Therefore, we get actually more tax in our side of the house that we can reinvest into the economy. We still think we're going on that clash. So firstly, our countries are likely to have comparative advantage, right? And notice that they literally give us like no reason as to why this was likely. They just said that some countries might have good climate. Uh, climates, right? We think that the majority of countries do not for the reason that, for example, Asian countries are often clumped together, for example, in Southeast Asia, where they have very similar climates, they have very similar geographical features, which means that they cannot, for example, Cam Cambodia obviously cannot compete with countries like Indonesia or Malaysia in terms of the scale of number that they have, or like the financial capabilities that they have, right? And moreover, we told you four reasons as to why Asia, these weaker Asian countries cannot compete with bigger, richer countries. I'm not going to reiterate them, but notice that there was literally Really zero engagement coming from their side of the house. So we think that the conclusion of this is it's very likely that these countries do not have some sort of comparative advantage, right? comparative advantage. What this means is that once they enter the market, they're likely to not be able to actually have anything that they can specialize in. There's likely to be massive unemployment, right? What were the pushes that came from their side of the house? Firstly, they said, ah, but it's impossible to shift and invest in these uh, industries in the first place because you need things like um, metal for factories and stuff, right? Like, firstly, I think that's reasonable for us to assume that we're not going to instantly haunt, halt international trade and suddenly shift to manufacturing right away. It can be, it's obviously going to be a more gradual and reasonably gradual process as in we're firstly going to probably import necessities that we need to some extent in order to build factories and then we slowly shift away into more local economy via things like providing subsidies and vouchers that's obviously the more reasonable scenario right but secondly, I think that in any country, some basic level of production of things like food and clothes exists, right? Obviously, there are local farmers. Obviously, there are things like local manufacturers of clothes. What we do in our side of the house is we take these pre-existing facilities and industries and strengthen them via things like uh, via things like subsidies and investment, right? It doesn't require us to start from scratch. We just build on what's already there. So we think it's perfectly possible, right? But then they secondly, they said that, ah, but we'll have more expensive and low quality like products in our side of the house. Firstly, they never impacted why this was necessarily a bad thing. I think that having, for example, a slightly like worse tasting tomato in our side of the house isn't a huge harm. But secondly, moreover, like these are basic necessities, right? Things like clothes, things like food, like if they function, they're basically pretty much okay. They don't need to be high quality in the first place, right? But thirdly, like even taking their best case and saying we have expensive shit in our side of the house still is better than their paradigm because in their paradigm, yes, products are cheap, but there is no employment in the first place. Like literally, if you do not have a job, if you do not have a waste regardless of how cheap and high quality a product is you cannot afford to have it in the first place at least in our side of the house these people do have jobs they might not be able to get the best clothes but they can afford things like rent they can afford things like clothes that is still on comparative better, right? But secondly, let's take their best case scenario and say that there is some sort of comparative advantage. What is this comparative advantage likely to be? It cannot be things like cheap labor. It cannot be things like cheap capital because obviously they cannot win against richer countries in this. It's likely to be the geographical features that they talk about, right? Which, so what is what is the uniqueness that is created by geography? It's often things like crops, things like tea, things like coffee, always these sort of like um, agricultural products, right? What is the problem with this? The problem with this is that this is extremely unstable in terms of fluctuation and demand, right? As in, firstly, there's a massive recession that's happening right now, which means that luxuries like coffee and tea obviously are low in demand. They say that, ah, demand will bounce back. Firstly, we think that that's speculative at best. But secondly, obviously, the vaccine won't spread at such a fast pace. Like, obviously, it won't necessarily, uh, we, we don't think the distribution will also automatically happen at a fast pace, right? But thirdly, like considering the fact that like, like half the people in the US don't even believe that COVID-19 is a thing, they don't wear masks, they, uh, it's politically ideological for them to like not try to take any actions in the first place. We think that's unlikely that this is going to be solved in the long run, right? But secondly, we think that the price is extremely fluctuating as in, for example, if you are a country that's relying on oil and then there's massive shale oil reserves figured out within the US, that 
leads to a massive drop in like price, which means that you can lead to massive like unemployment within your country. But thirdly, their own analysis, DLO said that ah, there's fluctuations in price because it's affected by various factors. In their paradigm, you are solely reliant upon that monoculture, so you get the full effects of having that like extremely fluctuating price. Whereas in our side of the house, you have manufacturing, you have different types of crops being grown because it's all within the local economy, so it's still relatively more stable. You get relatively better economy, right? But then they said ah, but corp international corporations will diversify, so we'll still get investment, right? The problem with this is economies of scale, right? As in, there's no incentive corporations do that. It's obviously easier to, for example, have factories all located within, for example, the country of China, because that means that, for example, you can build parts in one factory in China, in one part of China, and then don't have to pay a lot of transport fees to get those parts located to a factory that puts them together. It is obviously cheaper in terms of economies of scale for your corporations to not diversify. Therefore, we think that it's unlikely that they're going to advance into these countries, right? And for those reasons, we thought that at best, opposition was speculative, but lives are at stake. We cannot afford to be speculative. And for those reasons, we are happy to oppose. All right, thank you very much, Gov Whip, for those remarks. And finally, as a final substantive, the opposition side of the House's case, up with please. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Just give yep. me 10 seconds as I set up my timer. Yeah, go ahead. All right, I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. There were two serious issues with this government bench. The first, they assumed that they have an infinite amount of money to do whatever they wanted to on their side. That is to say things like giving out tax breaks and setting up like entirely new industries and supply chains to meet their entire local demand. The first thing to note here is that then they cannot claim that there is absolutely zero competitive advantage or whatever. But B, it is just unfounded for this government bench to assume that they have access to all of that money in the same place for them to do every single thing that they want to with that to essentially fix the demand also and the supply also and create entirely new local supply chains. We don't think that they managed to prove that basic link in that case and that is damning to them. The second then big issue is that they've just been incredibly uncomparative with the pretty reasonable stance that we've taken on the opposition bench which was that find the industries that you can do well in that you were succeeding in a post in the pre COVID world, things, for example, like finding the kind of advantage that exists. The important thing to note here is that if the response is true, that a lot of these countries don't have these uh, the, this comparative advantage, it necessarily does imply that that manufacturing that they are going to do and that they are going to start is going to be incredibly expensive because those that ground level infrastructure just doesn't exist. They cannot just fiat and assume that they get all of that on their side. Two things I want to weigh in this speech. First, where do we recover faster in the short term from all of the damage caused by COVID? And second, assuming that government, that this government magically does manage to recover, for which they have not had enough analysis, where do people live better lives in both respective forms of economy? So the first thing to note then about the COVID thing. This is the first and most important thing I want to highlight here is that the government did concede that this is going to be a much, much lower process on their side of the house where they say that you just can't phase out immediately. You need to like set up these supply chains. You need to procure things better. This becomes incredibly important and incredibly damning to their case because the impacts of COVID-19 have been incredibly terrible on a lot of these smaller economies, which was the problem that they started with in the first case. Things, for example, like a lot, in, a lot of people being unemployed and a lot of people not having access to the basic needs to live a dignified life. Then, therefore, if we can prove to you that we do recover much faster in the short term, we just take this debate irrespective of everything else that has been argued. So, with regards to this, then let's see what government has given here. The first thing to note here is that they've been pretty vague with respect to what all they are going to do because they say in the first week, like pretty wishy washy things like uh, we'll probably like subsidize the, the few farmers a bit more and that you'll end up giving people like some demand vouchers. You would posit that a large part of the issue with COVID 19, as they conceded in the second speech, is that a lot of the demand 
demand that existed like dipped within these economies and therefore what you probably need to focus on is on stimulating the kind of demand that exists notice then as we posited right from our first speaker when the uh, total amount of capital that you have is limited you probably can't end up doing both setting up supply chains and like stimulating demand and things I think that this government had to make a trade-off somewhere, and because they haven't been able to do that well enough, we think that's pretty problematic. But second, then a lot of the mechanism is that you will end up getting a lot of local uh, demand for a lot of different things. The first thing to note here is that a lot of this local demand just may not exist. Again, a lot of people have lost a lot of jobs and things like that. Notice then on the comparative, we think what is more important here is that the kind of international demand that we are able to access on our side is much more stable and much better for the economies. This is true for several reasons. The first is just that when you are like participating in a global economy, you do have access to like multiple countries that you can uh, trade with. Right? Things, for example, like like sending stuff both to the EU and to the US, where even if like US has a huge amount of mismanagement, you probably still have some things available. Notice then on the comparative is that when you are restricting your markets to the local market. There is no guarantee whether a lot of this local demand will be exist. But second, notice that this uncertainty is much, much higher on their side when you probably rely on the domestic economy of a weak economy with high unemployment and they're not sure uh, why they reduce uncertainty on their side at all. And notice, for example, a lot of the things they wanted to talk about, things uh, uh, like getting a lot of agriculture and supporting a lot of these farmers. One bad weather cycle probably means that an entire crop is wrecked and that a lot of people get forced into poverty, which is unfortunately what keeps happening in India. What we would then posit is that the way for you to then work around these things is to move to things that are a lot more stable things, for example, like the service industry that we posited on our side, which we do think has a huge amount of demand that did dip because of COVID, but as a consequence of the recovery happening around the world, which is just refused to engage with, it's probably coming back up again. Finally, then notice that they can't move these funds around in the future because things like factories are a incredibly static investment. You need to put in a lot of money into the ground level in, uh, infrastructure. And that is something, and that is money that you end up locking in. Notice in the, on the comparative, the kind of flexibility that you get when you are in a service economy is much higher because when you have a population that is able to cater to like international demand to a large extent, it's probably where you are likely able to like find new clients, for example, when a particular country goes out and fails when you have some kind of comparative advantage. The final thing then to justify over here is why we think we can win in that international trade, why we do have this comparative advantage. The first thing to note here is that we do think that there are some economies of scale that happens when you move to a global supply chain. That is so that you can probably do like some specific things within your own country that your own country can do incredibly well because of the kind of unique geographic factors that we posited right from our first piece. Things, for example, like the climate. But second, things like natural resources and not just climate, things like soil and rainfall. But third, the kind of manpower expertise that exists. But fourth, the kind of trust that you develop when clients are probably a lot more likely to buy from you from like long-term suppliers. Notice that even if the long-term advantage did not exist, we told to you, we told you why countries have an incentive to distribute the supply chains across multiple countries and not hedge their bets on one single basket. The final uh, thing, therefore, to note over here is that even if it is true that they probably are able to set up the industries, the first thing to note here then is that this does take a lot of time and therefore you have a lot more people suffering from poverty in that interim factor that we are able to solve when we are able to take advantage of the rapidly recovering like Western economies and that demand. But second then, even if it is true that the mechanism is that you have no competition, a direct corollary of this is that you probably don't have as much growth as a consequence of that also, that these industries probably end up getting stagnated, that you can probably only invest in the few like crops that are useful in your area. You can probably only invest uh, in the kind of manufacturing industries that are favorable in your region. Notice then that finally, when they say that international cooperation is required, that you need to import a lot of raw resources, you cannot just do everything on your own. This certainly then implies on their side that a lot of things end up getting much, much more expensive. The bottom line here, therefore, is that government is much less likely to recover from the global pandemic while we are able to recover. And second, even if they do recover, the kind of economies that you have is going to be much more expensive. So first, then, notice that let's assume that they do succeed at like creating more jobs. The first thing to note here is that when your economy is protectionist, you have a huge upper crap on your growth because the total demand you're ever going to have is limited by what your country is. But second, then you have a huge upper cap on what you can and can't manufacture simply because the kind of import tariffs you're going to put on other natural resources are going to be incredibly high, which just means that you cannot do whatever you want to. But third, notice that when goods 
become a lot more expensive a lot more the poor people literally suffer you have a lot less money to spend on food a lot less money to spend on income a lot less money to spend on like a lot less disposable income for you to do whatever you want to but secondly then when you have bad quality it literally reduces the yield you can get they cannot just say that our bad quality is fine we empower people to live better lives i'm incredibly proud to oppose Great. Thank you very much, Opposition Whip, for those remarks. And to begin the reply session of this great debate, Opposition Reply, please. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Yeah, clear. Great, just give me a few seconds, please. Good. <clears throat> Starting my speech in three, two, one. Two mechanizations which government bench never did and they've already lost this debate. One, why do they have the capital and the ability to go and develop industries, not just for a few sectors, but for literally everything, given they're going to restrict imports and increase tariffs, and that too, overnight and not over, say, five or 10 years. No mechanization. But two, why is local demand in one struggling Asian economy more certain than the demand across the local as well as international market, including more certain economies like the US and the EU? No analysis. Two metrics to justice debate. One, which side is more certainty in the short term? And two, what is better for this economy in the short term? Firstly, the only argument that they have for us was there's no comparative advantage. For one minute, let's just, let's just assume that you, you, didn't, you ignored all our analysis about like, things like better weather resources, et cetera. Nothing exists. Two reasons why we still have a comparative advantage. One, we told you why companies and countries, especially after COVID-19, have an incentive to go and diversify supply chains, even if it is the same product i.e. companies like Apple, etc., are manufacturing iPhones in Taiwan and in India and in Vietnam, etc. Places like Zara are manufacturing uh, clothes, etc. in Bangladesh, Vietnam as well. So which means you do have a distributed supply chain, you do have some comparative advantage. But two, we have the unique ability to create that comparative advantage by using the same money which they give for local subsidies and tax breaks to local companies, to these international companies to come here and invest in our own countries, which means we can create a comparative advantage with the same funding on their side of the house, which means we win this debate on the comparative advantage given that we told you points about like things like weather etc already before second this is ah they have less uncertainty and more local demand one you're literally in the middle of a recession how the hell do you have more more certainty on your side just because people want to buy apples and fruits does not mean they also want to buy literally every good out there which will go and boost your economy second we diversify risk on our side by going and have hedging our bets on international economies as well as local economies third agriculture etc requires cheap raw materials which they don't have on their side anymore they have to produce them themselves i'm not sure where they come from magically but fourth real sector economy and manufacturing etc relies a lot more on externalities you rely on rainfall you rely on oil prices, etc. You rely on the international markets fluctuating to a larger extent compared to our side, where service sector, etc. does not rely on these kind of things. So I'm really not sure why they're still more certain on their side. But notice this, right? They say, ah, we will just build the economy from whatever we have. One, you don't have enough of like existing infrastructure abilities because if you did, you would be China. But two, you can't just build it overnight because it requires large amounts of investment. On the comparative, we will use existing infrastructure and existing factories which are already well developed and we have a comparative advantage or we'll go and push in money in the service sector which requires much lesser investment to be able to get the same returns which government bench wants. But two, though the comparative in this debate is not just getting rotten tomatoes in your house, the comparative is literally not getting access to so many amounts of goods which China produces the, the, the goods which become so, so expensive because you don't have the natural resources or the manufacturing capability to go and produce them. You can't just learn how to produce things in one month. It takes a long time to come up with a real sector economy. But then, why do we still have demand for the service sector and for our economy in the international market? We give you three reasons. One, there's a fatigue in the international market, right? Which means you have people who want to travel, people who want to invest in the service sector. You have people with a lot of money which is stored for the last one year and a lot of frustration. 
Two, people, these developed countries are moving away from COVID, right? They have vaccines already, which have come about. But three, they're moving towards hybrid models of like work from home, et cetera, which requires more IT and call center, et cetera, which we can uniquely provide in our own countries. We win this metric. The second metric is about which world is better in the short term. One, we told you, and government bench concedes in the WIP speech that they can't possibly in, in, implement a real sector economy overnight, which means in the short term itself, we're able to prove to you why even overnight, we have the existing capabilities to be able to get short term impetus in the economy. But two, the infrastructure on our side already exists. You can give further subsidies and import reduction to capitalize on the advantage that you already have and make it even, even larger on our side of the house. But third, we don't rely on things like rainfall, et cetera, on our side, which are so external and so uncertain, and can, you can't hedge your demands in a in a shit economy at that point of time. People are dying. People are hungry panel. The only thing government bench does is increase prices, deny them access to basics, and increase uncertainty. We're very proud to win this debate. Great. Thank you very much uh, for the opposition reply for those remarks. And then finally, to close this debate, government reply, please. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Yeah, clear. Okay. The biggest reason why the side proposition takes this debate is because we are unlikely to completely fail the people that live within these countries. We told you that things like specializing in the clothing industry means you're affected by things like speculative prediction of when this demand will come back. It is not your country. It is a prediction of another country in another, in another, in another, in another, in another world that you have no knowledge about. You don't really know when this demand spikes up. Secondly, this means if you lose this particular competition within this particular industry, you lose everything. But the third thing is you're influenced by countless externalities because of the fluctuation in the economy. Compare that to the real goods that we talked about. We think these are basic necessities, which means there's a constant demand within your country, but also your, market, your domestic market is protected. So there's a constant demand kept at, that, kept at that constancy. But the final thing is probably calculation is easier. Your government is better able to adjust to what kind of differences, you, uh, the differences within your market compared to the vast speculation that opposition side stands for. I think this is so important because the governments that we're talking about in this debate do not have the capacity to low, like to low money in order to give employment benefits, uh, unemployment benefits to the people on the ground. The one failure that the opposition side talks the, the, of this debate means that you lose the lives of thousands of people on the ground. Yes, farming is farming is influenced by things like externalities as well, but the scale of the impact of that externality is far, far, far less when you have diverse uh, fields of diverse industries you can rely on. Their side only has one, and that was the problem of this debate. Their first claim was we assumed infinite amounts of money. We have told you on the other side of the house that these are already things that existed in the first instance, and it's just an like expansion of what we already have. Because it's unlikely that countries have no like agricultural capacity. It is unlikely that countries have absolutely no clothing industry. These are things that people demand, and, government, and we've told you that governments have an incentive to ensure that there's a minimum amount of production of these basic necessities, even on the outside of the house. Therefore, I think it is impossible to. Uh, we've also told you that things like things like things like farming cost very little amount of money. Money, and it's very possible to expand this on the other side of the house with relatively low cost. We're not standing for overnight creation of these things, but we think we're able to gradually expand. That's our point. They say, um, of one opposition side of the house, I think this, um, this I think this symmetrical claim applies to both opposition side of the house as well. Because to the extent that we told you that there was a massive pullout from the industries within these countries, it is unclear how much, like what kind of money that they have, what kind of capital that they have in order to bolster this industry, in order to expand this industry to a great extent on the other side of the house as well. They also assume the existence of resources. It is unfair, therefore, to, to only claim that we were the ones that assumed infinite amount of money. I think this is symmetrical. First, uh, secondly, why uh, on comparative advantage? Leader of opposition asserts that it's about India and Bangladesh. We showed you that it's untrue for, this, for the structural reason of having one, like, or, or, or structural reason of the competition and game theory, which means only one 
country is likely to succeed. I think things like climate or manpower was shared by many countries in Asia. And I think that was the reason why this comparative advantage did not exist to many countries. DLO says diversification. Uh, compare that to the argument from Kanan about concentration and how economies of scale is more beneficial to cooperation in terms of the economy. The response from opposition side of the house was Apple, which is just an example. It doesn't prove anything, but also they never they, they, they never bothered characterizing the risks. Like, what kind of risks are they talking about? They don't really quantify the amount of risks that corporations shoulder by not diversifying. I think it's more concrete as an analysis than what Kanan gave you to, in this debate. Therefore, I think the conclusion of this is that things it is the conclusion of this is the vast majority of countries in this particular debate are unlikely to have comparative advantage, at least compared to that of China, at least compared to that of powerful countries that exist within our side of the house, which means their, their failure to engage with the entire point of our competition is super, super damaging. Because to the extent that we've shown you that the other countries in the international society have both the capacity and incentive to outcompete you in the market where there's a vacancy of contract, where, there, where, there, where, there, where there's a vacancy of powerful corporations uh, which you know dominate the world dominated the world prior to COVID-19 means that all of the investment you use in this particular industry is likely to go in vain. That was why on grounds of certainty we think we have clearly won this debate. We don't fail the people, they do. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much for the government reply. Thank you very much, everyone, for what was a really, really, truly an excellent debate and a very close one at that. Uh, inviting everyone to virtually cross floor, shake hands, and give me around 20 minutes amount of time, at least in order to arrive at a decision. And then we'll speak after that point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you for the debate, everyone. Thanks for the debate, everyone. Thank you for the debate. Thank you. Thank you.